Well, good morning, everyone. Sorry if I was a little unwieldy last night. <laughs> it happens. Uh, well, it's great to see all of you. Um, we're going to... I have this funny story. So I, I just recently was with... Um, I, 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 I speak at these Palau events um, called the President's uh, Councils, which is like uh, people that have been invested in the Palau organization for... Uh, for years, some people over 35 years, uh, and they do three events a year, like one in California or Arizona, one in Oregon, and then one in Florida. And uh, this last one, um, uh, Pat Palau, um, Luis's uh, wife, um, she uh, she doesn't come to all of them, and she's uh, I really love her. She's the, probably one of the key reasons that I'm doing the speaking for them um, because. Uh, she told me when we for, after spending a weekend together, most people are scared of her because she's very feisty. Uh, and uh, she definitely uh, kept Luis in line for sure. Uh, and she, uh, she goes, I like this boy to Luis. She's like, he reads the right books. <laughs> but we're at this event, and so I've got very close with her, like a fifth son or something. And uh, I was saying how my wife and I like to go vintage clothes shopping, and I, I bought these green pants, these old bell bottoms <laughs> in uh, Newburgh, and I wore them to speak in, and she came up to me afterwards, and she goes, don't buy any more of those pants. <laughs> and I said, I go, I go, I love these pants. And then she literally walked behind me and like looked at, looked at how they fit my butt, and she goes, they don't fit you very well. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, dang it. Well, tell me what you really think, Pat. <laughs> it's great. It was just like the, like the mom just being just disappointed in how her kid's dressing. It was so good. <laughs> uh, well, today we're going to consider the final word from the cross. Um, and uh, this uh, is a word of, of, of rest, um, a word of confidence, um, and Jesus, we're told in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 49, this is where we get this, uh, this final statement. It says, it was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, so interesting they call it a spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. It's a very profound scene. Um, the drawing of Jesus uh, and the various responses to that drawing uh, is, a, um, is a profound and um, continued reality for us today. Uh, but I think what we have to actually consider is, is the confidence uh, in which Jesus speaks here. Uh, there's something more, something more profound uh, because here at the close of his torment, there is full control and there is peace. Uh, this is uh, what I call the death of death and the birth of rest. And it should bring a tremendous uh, amount of confidence uh, to our uh, commitment uh, to follow Jesus throughout our life. Uh, this this whole statement, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, is a reminder that of what we considered last night, that it's finished. The work has been done. Martin Luther wrote um, in his Heidelberg Disputation, the law says, do this, and it is never done. Grace says, believe in this, and everything is already done. That is kind of the motto of my life as a follower of Jesus. Uh, and as I said last night, when we live with that reality, uh, this does not cheapen grace. Grace is never cheap. 
is costly, but it is always free. It's always free. And any time we try to get back on that ladder to climb to some sort of fulfillment, uh, you know, uh, it, it's going to end. Uh, it's going to end with a bitter pill. Uh, but what's so fascinating is that the, the default setting of the human heart is to climb ladders. Uh, it's what we do. Uh, and we get back on, and I would argue that we would rather climb a ladder and exhaust ourselves. In fact, we would even rather fall off a ladder than die on a cross. Uh, but the cross is not something we climb. It's something we die on. And it's not a once a one-time death, it's a daily death until uh, we pass into the eternity that awaits us. As I said the other night, there is a peace that is coming, that beautiful um, impressionistic painting by Monet will be the reality of heaven, but on this side of eternity, our peace is found in the midst of the tribulation. And this is why we have to cast ourselves, build our lives on the right foundation, uh, the right foundation. Um, you know, I think we get so obsessed with what we're building, we never ask the question if it's being built on the right foundation. Uh, in fact, you're better off uh, in a tent on the rock than you are with a mansion on the sand. <laughs> and uh, I think that just came to me. If someone could write that down. <laughs> Um, I'd like to use that later. <laughs> I, I used to listen to Chuck Smith like teach through the, when I first got saved, someone gave me the Chuck teaching through the entire Bible, and it was notorious. You'd have cassettes, and you could listen to it at double speed um, to get through it faster. Uh, but he would often make comments. He's like, the other day, I was listening to the radio, and I came on, and I thought to myself, that was rich. <laughs> but I get what he's saying that there are these moments where the Holy Spirit like you listen back you're like well, I said that that's pretty good I don't know where that came from and that's why the Lord gets us out of the way the foolish conduits <laughs> so um, I, I love this picture of confidence uh, because this is a this is like the fulfillment even of what we see in Genesis 2 2 and on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from his work that he had done. And here Jesus, Jesus is committing himself. He's putting himself in his father's hands like a little child that's, uh, that's ready to go to sleep um, and wants to be carried to bed. Uh, there is just this incredible, uh, the intimacy, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever caused that that divide, relational divide due to the bearing of sin within the Godhead, that sense of the Father's absence and the sense of the Father losing his Son and the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the Trinity feeling this disconnect within themselves, that, that full uh, intimacy has been now restored because the work is finished. Uh, and that is such a beautiful thing for us to think about. I love it because last words actually tell us a lot about people. Um, there's many famous people whose final words um, are recorded. And I think that, that when we consider Jesus' last words, I mean, it just brings such comfort to me. Because when I look at, you know, I mean, there are a lot of people, I, I think of uh, um, the words, the last words spoken um, by Sigmund Freud to his daughter was words of anger. This is absurd. It's absurd. I, I think of the, the heartbreaking words of Chris Farley, the great, in my opinion, one of the greatest uh, comedians, at least physical comedians, uh, that America's produced. And he was a believer, um, but he was also a deeply troubled man. He was a man of mixture. Um, and he, he was last, the last thing that was reported that he said uh, on a drinking and, and drug binge uh, was to a prostitute who had spent the weekend with, and he, and he cried out to her as she was leaving the room, please don't leave, please don't leave. That's so heartbreaking. Um, sometimes it's humorous. Now, I think this is mythology, but I really like it. Oscar Wilde is reported to have said, either the wallpaper goes or I do. 
<laughs> Sounds like something he would say, though. Uh, where they're beautiful, like Mother Teresa. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Those are the last words reported from her lips before she passed. Yet, in the words of Jesus, there's something more, something more profound. Um, because it's not an end, it's a beginning. And it's a new beginning, not just for him, but for all of us. Uh, and so I think that um, this, is, this is a word that I pray brings a tremendous amount of comfort to you today. But let's consider um, just a few aspects of his confidence uh, as we wrap up this, this series. Uh, first of all, um, he was confident that the work that his father had given him was done. And we considered this verse last night, um, but there, there's something more to it that I want to I just add. That, that, that verse in John 17, 4, Father, I've glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Remember what he said to his disciples, uh, you know, this is, this is the incompleteness of our work compared to the finished work of Jesus. But the finished work of Jesus was because of our incompleteness. That work that he entered into was to work out the redemption that we could never work out for ourselves because we can't climb the ladder. The, ladder, the distance between God and man is just too vast um, in, a, in a fallen state. And, and I would argue that the incarnation actually even changed, uh, that even the relationship with God for us now is even different than what our first parents had in the garden uh, because, because we actually have the creator as creature now. That the incarnation, uh, in fact, it was, a, I think it was, it's one of the patristic fathers, which one was it? I think it might have been Clement that, um, that famously spoke of the fall. He called it, O Felix Culpa, O Happy Guilt. And I, I don't know that we should ever celebrate the fall, but, his, but the, the argumentation is that the fall actually is what brought forth an even greater revelation, which is God's own entrance into his creation. That he, the risk of creating uh, beings that could rebel against his, his, uh, his love, to, that could reject his grace, that could, re, that could rebel against his creation uh, was worth it. And redemption was already planned out. He had already taken it into account. And Jesus, the entrance of the Son of God, uh, because the Son of God was not always Jesus. Jesus is what the unchanging God became without changing, which is a total mystery, paradox all in and of itself. He wasn't a human being in eternity past, but it is something that he became, as it says in the Nicene Creed, uh, that he became a man for us. Again and again, for us. He became a man for us, lived the perfect life as a man for us, died the sinless death for us, rose from the dead for us, ascended into the heavens, and is sitting at the right hand of the Father for us, has spent his spirit to dwell in us for us, all of this as a man forever. And this is an incredible reality um, that, that we, the unseen God has now seen in the eyes of Jesus. This is why Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. But when we consider this, this confidence in that finished work, um, I, I think about his words uh, to Peter. We were I was talking outside with a gentleman yesterday, and I, I've always been struck by this. You know, chapter breaks um, were added to, uh, to the manuscript, uh, to the biblical manuscript. Verses, uh, verse numbers was added. Punctuation is added uh, to, the, to the Greek manuscript. And so this is why um, one of my favorite, if you guys want a really fascinating study Bible that kind of, uh, it's probably the best uh, 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 translation that actually allows you to look over the shoulder of the translators um, uh, throughout throughout time on how they came to choices, where there is debate. Um, it's the Net Bible. Uh, and the Net, it's, <laughs> it's very, very small print. I, I almost like recommend it on like a device because it's, uh, I use it in my 
Bible software because it's so my eyesight, like my eyes are bloodshot right now from reading all morning. Um, I, but I, I, I can't hardly read the notes. But it's like the text, and then it's just surrounded by like I think there's over sixty thousand footnotes on any place where a word was translated, where there were various translations of that word. Uh, so it's super fascinating because you, you, what you'll see actually is, uh, you know, we, we believe uh, in the inspired word of God, uh, but translations are not always <laughs> inspired. <laughs> and there's definitely, there's definitely some, some missteps throughout the ages. And that's okay. I think that the spirit of God can transcend the, the mistakes of humans uh, for sure. Um, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't mess with my, my, uh, my faith grid at all. Uh, but one of the things that I, I always have been troubled by is this break in John um, between chapter 13 and 14. Because Nowhere is there a place where the finished work of Jesus uh, is contrasted with why he had to do the work and the incompleteness of the very people that was closest to him. And at the close of 13, it's a conversation with Peter. And, Peter, and, and Jesus tells him that he has to die, that he has to suffer. And Peter's like, like Lord, uh, he, and he said, "You're going to all leave me. You're going to all you're going to all abandon me." And and Peter's like, "I would never abandon you, Lord." Classic impulsive Peter. I love him. He like he just he speaks before thinking. I can really get my head around that. Um, uh, and he's he's like, "I would never I would never leave you." And he meant it. He meant it. But listen. All you know is all there is. <laughs> and he didn't know what was about to happen. And so he spoke in ignorance, which is what we as humans do, because we're far more confident in our understanding of the world around us than we ought to be. You want to read a book that will undermine your, all of your belief and your own thinking is just read Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow uh, by Daniel Kahneman, and you'll never trust your decision making again. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I love this. He's like, He's like, I'd never leave you. I'd, I'd lay down my life for you, Lord. And Jesus says, I tell you this, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Three times. And we think, oh my gosh, what a discouraging statement that he just made. But that's because there's a chapter break right there. But what comes immediately after? What's the next verse? Does anyone know? Let not your heart be troubled. Peter, you're going to deny me three times, but let not your heart be troubled. It's a continuation. It, the conversation is a continuation. You're going to deny me three times, but let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Peter, that's the whole reason I've come, <laughs> is because you're going to deny me, because that's what human beings do in a fallen state. That's, that's what you do without my spirit within you. That's why he would go on to say, it's good that I go to the Father. For if I don't go to the Father, then the helper won't come to you. But when I go, this, the helper, the spirit of truth, the paraclete, he will come and he will bring to remembrance all that I have said. And he will teach you and he will guide you into all truth. He will be a comforter. He will be just like me. And that's what, why the um, Upper Room Discourse is such a profound text because it, um, and it's also a profound Trinitarian text because it's, it's, it's infused with uh, what could be called the vanishing distinction. It's like one moment Jesus is talking about himself, then he's talking about the Spirit, then he's talking about the Father, and then he, those lines are constantly being blurred, and you're like, Jesus, are you talking about you or the Father or the Spirit? And he just says, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so he's like, this, me dwelling with you is now going to be me in you by my Spirit. And that's why he said, greater things will you do than what you've seen me do. Why? Because I'm now going to be able to do things in the bodies of many. <laughs> the same work that I've been doing, I'm going to now be doing through you because I have finished the work that you could never finish. You know, one of the most beautiful scenes, actually, in the, the Bible, um, and I heard a pastor, actually, it was John MacArthur's father, um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard Jack MacArthur. Um, I love Jack MacArthur's sermons. Um, he was, uh, uh, people don't know him. He's not nearly as well known. I prefer his preaching. Um, his preaching is grace infused. Uh, I mean, seriously, like, the guy was just, he had a beautiful way of 
seeing kind of between the lines in, the, in narratives especially. And I remember hearing a, a sermon by him on um, Peter catching the eyes of Jesus in the courtyard um, after, uh, after the betrayal. Because Luke records that Jesus basically looked across the court. Je Peter denies him the third time. And it says that Jesus looked across the courtyard after being beaten. And they caught eyes. And it says Peter began to weep bitterly. Um, when you consider the two kinds of repentance between Peter and, and Judas, it's very different. Um, Peter's weeping bitterly was a, was a weeping in the right direction. Uh, Judas, uh, Judas um, mourning over his betrayal of Jesus, instead of turning to Jesus, he turned to the betrayers and tried to return the money when he should have just went to the one whom he had kissed. Um, and I think that the opportunity for Judas, I don't think God created Judas to be an object of his damnation. I think that that fully pushes against the character of God as revealed in Scripture. Um, we should never attribute evil to God. Uh, and I think that this is one of those mysterious moments in which I really truly believe that Jesus loved Judas uh, um, because it, that's consistent with what Scripture says. Uh, but Judas turned, he repented in the wrong direction. He repented in the wrong direction that led to a despair that ultimately he would take his own life. Um, he hung himself for a tr from a tree when he should have gone to the one who hung on the tree for him. Um, and he didn't. And it's a heartbreaking message, a heartbreaking story. But Peter, when he catches the eyes of Jesus, what Jack MacArthur said, he goes, what do you think that look communicated? What do you think that look communicated? I think immediately we think, oh, he must have looked at him and just been like, Peter, I'm so disappointed in you. No. I believe that the look that he gave him, and I, I totally agree with, with Jack on this, is that that look was, Peter, I love you. It's, this is, it's okay. This is the whole reason I came. It's the whole reason I came. Uh, I was having a really hard time, super hard time at the church. Um, and uh, my, my, my best friend, um, uh, Dr. Tim Mackey, uh, uh, if you guys have, how many of you guys have heard of the Bible Project? Um, if you haven't heard of it, you should look it up. It's incredibly profound. Um, Tim uh, was, uh, it, it is a PhD in Hebrew studies. I think he is the best Bible expositor in North America, for sure. Uh, I, I, I put hands down, there is no one better that I know, that I've heard, uh, and, he is, and he is truly the most humble human being I have ever known. He, the thing that's so hard for him is he, uh, he's become famous because of the Bible Project, and he hates it. <laughs> he's like, he doesn't even have email. Like, he's, he doesn't, I mean, he lives a very, very simple focused life, and he is the most gentle soul. But he, I hired him. The Bible Project actually started out of Door of Hope. I hired him in 2012 um, to become um, a teaching pastor on staff with me. And I, I was really interested in how do you prevent that kind of celebrity culture around a singular personality. And I, didn't, I wasn't tired of preaching. I was happy. I'm, I could do this every week. Um, but I knew that it would be healthy for the church to have, I'm more of a preacher. He is definitely a true teacher, um, that balance. And we taught 50-50. It was a very unique relationship, and it was blessed five years. But in 2016, the Bible Project had gotten so big, and I knew it was coming. Um, that I mean, he was, first it was one day a week, and then he needed two days a week, and then it was three days a week. Uh, and I mean, it's supported by the European Bible Society, the American Bible Society. Even the Catholic Church has now hired them to to make expl explanatory videos around the, uh, um, around the Apocrypha. I actually asked him, I go, so do you think that it's inspired? And he goes, he goes, no. He goes, but it's really interesting. <laughs> that is the graciousness of Tim Mackey right there. <laughs> and, um, but he, uh, he, he, he stepped down in 2016, and it was a massive loss. I mean, I was so proud of him, and I was so glad. I mean, it was an honor to be able to release him to something so 
amazing that was impacting so many people. But he's my best friend. Like we hung out every day, and we still see each other every month. But uh, but I knew it, I wasn't going to have the same time with him. It was there was a lot of transition in the church. I was exhausted. Um, I was hitting. I was hitting like it was like probably my second stage of burnout at Door of Hope. Um, and I went on a trip to. I went on a trip to the UK, and I was speaking. Uh, I mean, I was uh, I was. Um, at a thing around Alpha, um, and it was at Holy Trinity Brompton in London. And there was a time um, where they gathered all of us pastors. It was a group of about 60 of us pastors um, from kind of significant urban churches um, from around the world, a really cool group. Um, and they said, hey, we know um, that you're here to explore Alpha, and uh, you know we don't want you to think that the only reason you're here your ears so that we can sell alpha to you. Um, we also know that you guys live, uh, live out very difficult lives um, doing ministry in difficult places, and many of you are probably feeling weary in your ministry, and we want to just give you the opportunity uh, to, to allow us to pray over you. Um, and so they have a very, um, I don't, uh, <laughs> how would I describe Holy Trinity Brompton? It's like a, it's like a vineyard church in Anglican garbs. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, everything just sounds intellectual when you have an English accent. So um, <laughs> there's a, there, but there is this really beautiful, like, balance. Uh, they're charismatic, but I would say that the, my, ex, my experience there, and that's just visiting, has been just a very, I, I, I actually love the way that they're charismatic because the, the main thing I would say is they, they just seem to have a tremendous expectancy that Jesus is going to show up when they gather, and they have a really beautiful prayer ministry. Nothing weird happened for me while I was there. That's all I can say. For those of you who are like, I don't know about that. Um, so uh, I, so I, I, they said, hey, if you want prayer, just come forward while the music's playing, and, we'll, and we'll just, people will just come around, and we'll lay hands on you and pray over you. Um, and I was, I'm a contrarian, so the moment they said to do that, I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And I literally backed up. I backed up against the wall, and I had my arms crossed, and I was in there, and this guy's just playing guitar, and it wasn't even like necessarily like the style of music that I'm into. Any of that didn't, none of that really mattered. It was just this moment, something just happened, and I just started feeling like, <laughs> like, like I started getting the chest heaves and like the kind of quivering lip. <laughs> and I was like, and I just had my head bowed, and I was like, what's going on? And then before I knew it, I don't even know why this was happening, but I just started walking forward. And, and then all of a sudden, I'm just standing, like, in front of the stage, basically. And there was space around me. And the moment I got up there, and this has only happened to me a couple times in my life. I'm not a guy that's had, like, these insane, you know, uh, I've, I've had a few times where things that, um, where God seemed to intervene uh, in the laws of his own <laughs> creation. And uh, I experienced kind of the supernatural sense of his love. Um, and that's the main thing. Uh, it was just this overwhelming sense of his love. And, and it was like the still soft voice. I could just hear, I just, I just started to, I st my whole body just felt warm and I started to just weep and weep, and I couldn't stop crying, and I just felt this, I felt this overwhelming sense, like as I felt God's presence, I was undone by it, and it wasn't, and, and what's interesting is it, it, it was truly a moment where his kindness was leading me to repentance, uh, and I just, I was like, Lord, I just, have, I, I just feel like I'm, I'm failing in every area, I feel like a fraud, um, I, I don't know what I'm doing, and, uh, and I, I think I'm, I'm messing up the church, and I just, I just like, I was having this conversation, and I'm crying, and, and, um, and I feel a hand on my shoulder, and the moment the hand touched my shoulder, I just, I heard this, it was like, literally like a voice, it was just like, Josh, it's okay, I love you, you're okay, I love you. You're doing fine, <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> like just like fully like lost my stuff. So then I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a person with their stinking hand on my shoulder, and I look over my shoulder, and there's no one there. And uh, 
And then I freaked out. <laughs> and then, then I was like, like, and my friend Dane was watching me from the other side of the room. And he walks over to me and he puts his hand on my chest and he goes, what's going on, buddy? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. I think I'm a fraud. I think I'm a, I, like, I just start crying. He goes, just let it out. And then he just prayed this beautiful prayer for me. And then I was like, all right, enough of this. And then I ran downstairs in the bathroom, cried a little bit more. And then I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. We're going. I'm going to go in peace. So, um, so I get home. I fly home on, a, on, uh, on Saturday, um, Saturday, and I have to preach on Sunday. And I'm so jet-lagged. And uh, I get home, and my wife and my, my daughter are sitting in the living room when I get home. And I sat down, and I began to tell, tell them about what happened. And as I'm telling them what happened, I start crying again. And uh, Darcy and my wife, like, seriously, she thinks like me crying is like the sexiest thing that ever happened. Like, because <laughs> it, it's so rare. She's like, she, and she is like, a, like the ultimate empath. So she's just like, the moment I start crying, she starts, she's like, oh baby, are you crying? And I'm like, this is this is working out to my benefit right now, but I, I, um, <laughs> and I'm like I'm I'm like I'm like yeah I don't know what's wrong with me I I think I I think I'm just really jet lagged um, and uh, and and then I realized Hattie who's very verbal like me hadn't said a word and I look over at my like my little girl and she was she was uh, she was 13 or 12 she was 12 when this when this happened. Um, and uh, she's 16 now, yeah, 12. Um, she, I look up at her, and she's, her, she's crying. And I'm like, oh, honey, I, like, like I, it's not, like, she looked upset to me. And I was like, I'm like, I, I, honey, I'm totally fine. I'm like, I don't, don't, don't be upset. And then she goes, she just looks at me, and she goes, no, Dad. She's like, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And she said, I feel like I just saw you for the, for the first time. It's a hard one to get out of your mouth. <laughs> and listen, I'm extremely close with my daughter. I always have been. She's always been a daddy's girl. And, and you know, I think that that is a picture of um, the finished work of Jesus uh, uh, being played out by my daughter experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit in me, and that she saw me in a different light. Um, and I always say that, you know, to be spirit-filled, um, I am a person who believes that the baptism of the spirit is what happens at regeneration. That's an immersion into uh, the body of Christ. But um, what I, a lot of language within charismatics or if they talk about baptism of the spirit, uh, which is I, I, I personally hold, I think words matter and how we say things matters. Um, I would say that it's a filling. So there are times when you experience the filling of the spirit uh, in such a way that, that the presence of God just feels, and it's just a yieldedness. It's just a surrender that comes. This is what we see Jesus doing right now in his confidence in, in the Father accomplishing, having accomplished his work. He is confident that the work that the Father had given him is done. And, and, and that moment with me in that living room was the evidence that it indeed was done. Um, and and I, I think it, this is what I always say, that being spirit-filled is not you getting more of the spirit. Uh, the spirit is not something to obtain. He's someone to surrender to. It's being filled is the spirit getting more of you, getting more of you. Um, and, and I love this because this is what the accomplished work has brought forth into our lives. The resources of the finished work of Jesus is available to us. And the resources is not stuff or things or gifts even. It's the gift, which is God's presence himself dwelling within sinful, broken, flawed, glitchy human beings like you and I. It's a beautiful reality of the gospel. And when we understand that, and when we understand this statement, we see that the ladder has been dismantled. Now, I haven't explained this to you, but the reason I use the phrase ladder is because it's actually, um, in our English translation, uh, Jacob's ladder is, is a profound and mysterious vision. 
And we see in Genesis that there is a ladder from heaven. Jacob lays his head on a stone. Why? I don't know why he would choose that for a pillow. Um, uh, and he, he receives a vision where he sees a ladder from earth to heaven. And at the top, um, there are angels ascending and descending upon the ladder. And then God proclaims uh, his covenant promise over Jacob. Now, what's really profound about that is that covenant promise is always is pointing toward this moment, toward Jesus. Uh, but one is struck by the insurmountable gulf between heaven and earth. And the only things that's on that ladder are angels, messengers from God to man and back from man to God. Um, and so this, this insurmountable distance, and then that ladder is never mentioned again, ever. Do you know that? It's not mentioned again in Scripture until John chapter 1, verse 51. And it's when Jesus says, you believe because I saw you under the tree? Listen, I tell you, you will see greater things than these when you see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You guys, Jesus is the ladder. <laughs> he is God come down to us. This is why the gospel is literally down to earth. Down to earth. It's earthy. <laughs> and, and we're not going to find him trying to climb up there. In fact, when the disciples watch Jesus ascend, what do the angels say after? It's like, why are you still looking into the heavens? He's going to come back the same way he left. So go do what he said. <laughs> go, and, and what did they do? They went, they went to the upper room, uh, and they prayed, and they waited for the coming of the promised gift. It's profound. He was confident also in his father's care. Um, uh, this, is, this is something that's so important for us. I come from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Uh, he, he, he is truly giving us a picture of what saving faith looks like. Um, because saving faith is not the belief that God exists. It's not even the belief that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for the sins of the world. Uh, it doesn't matter if you believe the right things. I, it, it matters of, of what do you allow the object of, that, of, your, of your faith to do for you. Are you a true faith, a saving faith, is not faith that Jesus exists. A true faith is a faith that allows Jesus to be Jesus in and through us. It's a confidence in his care. And if the gospel declares anything, it declares that God cares about you. He cares about you. And Jesus is modeling for us what true confidence looks like, what, it, what real surrender looks like. It's a surrender that allows him to experience respite at the end of a climactic and tormented moment in his life, in his earthly life. He just went to hell. He's literally gone to hell and back. <laughs> and, he's, and, and he has finished that work and there is now this strange calmness and respite that has come over Jesus in the midst of a crowd that is standing there waiting for him to die. An enemy that thinks it's won, but actually in reality has just been defeated. That on the cross, sin died with Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Our sins have died with Jesus. <laughs> I, that sin and death and the dominions of darkness no longer um, have the final word. Uh, yes, they're a reality that play out in our lives, but they do not have the same domination <laughs> because Jesus literally has dominated them. <laughs> he has conquered them. He is Christus Victor. And there is now a childlike calmness in the Father's care. Father's care. You know, that's why the early church, when people would die, um, it was a common practice for final words to simply be good night in the early church. You know, my friend Steve Brand 
um, who died of cancer at 45 years old. Um, it's my wife's best friend's husband. Um, and he died in 2011. It was actually two years after Dorf Hope began. Him and I never got along. He didn't, he didn't like me because I was a Christian. And so he was very, and he was very smart. He's a beloved school teacher at Chapman Elementary in Portland. Progressive guy, grew up Catholic, almost became a priest, and then abandoned his faith in college. But when he got terminal cancer, um, and I've known, I knew Mindy actually before I even knew Darcy, um, and I met Darcy through Mindy because they were roommates. Uh, so, I mean, we go way back. Uh, and they have, she has two girls uh, uh, who, the youngest, Charlotte, is my daughter's best friend and is like a daughter to me. And Ruby has always been like a daughter to me. I mean, I love these girls. Uh, but when Steve got sick, the girls were really little. I think Charlotte was only like four um, or five. And Ruby was like, I think Ruby was seven. So they didn't fully know, understand what was happening. But I remember the last month of Steve's life, he went from not really liking me very much to me being the only person he wanted to talk with. He wouldn't even really talk with his wife or his girls because it was, he was so terrified of dying, so terrified. In fact, up to a month before he died, he was still trying to figure out like a rat in a cage how to get out of this predicament he was in. Um, and, and Mindy was just like, you know, it just was, she was so overwhelmed, so emotionally exhausted from treatment, and, and he, you know, they thought he had kicked it, he had lymphoma, um, and, it, and it came back with a vengeance after two years in remission, and they found this massive tumor in his stomach, and it was too progressed to even deal with. And so he, here he is, he's dying, and he requests to meet with me, and I began to meet with him almost every day. And all he wanted to talk with me about, it's, it's amazing what, uh, what looming death will bring out in a person. All he wanted to talk with me about was God. And, and two days before he died, on December, uh, December 23rd, uh, he died actually on Christmas morning. On December 23rd, 2011, uh, he prayed to receive Jesus. And he stopped talking that day. That, uh, the next next day I get a call from Mindy and she's like he's not doing well I, I we need the we're, we're calling the ambulance to come and take him to hospice right now um, I think he's really close and so I ran and she sounded a little frantic so we we came over to the house and um, I rem I'll never forget it like the Christmas lights on the tree were dim and the room smelled like death and the death rattle had begun and he was laying on the couch and he and he he was just he was so pale and so frail, and his body had like emaciated, become emaciated. Um, and um, he was just laying there, and I just sat by him. And Mindy was so overwhelmed that her and Darcy and the girls actually left the house, and they left me alone with him. I was actually kind of frustrated. I'm like, what? You can't leave me. Like, what if he dies with me? And I hadn't actually sat with anyone when they had died. At this point in my life, um, I hadn't actually sat with anyone when they died, and I thought it was going to happen while they were gone. Um, and I just began reading the Bible to him. I just was reading... I was reading the upper room discourse to him and, uh, um, and just kept thinking about the fact that he prayed to receive Jesus the morning before. And then Mindy comes back and the girls kissed their dad's forehead. It was the last time they saw him. They kissed him and they left, they left the house and went to the neighbor's house. And then Mindy collapsed like a tree at his head. And the first time I've ever heard someone wail, like, yeah. you know that, that sound. <laughs> like it was just like, I just I had never experienced anything like that, and she just wailed, and it woke Steve up out of a slumber, and he and he he like opened his eyes, and he and she was crying at his head, and I was sitting next to him, so I was really close. It was very it was like this emotionally intimate experience, and Darcy was standing behind me, and she's just, just weeping, and um and. Steve was reaching for Mindy. He was trying to reach, but his arms were so weak. And I, I'm like, Mindy, Mindy. And then she apologized for wailing. And I'm like, no, no, honey, listen, look at, like, Steve's trying to talk with you. He's trying to communicate with you. She wraps, uh, I help him wrap his arms around her. Um, and, and, he, and then he goes, he actually spoke. This is the last things he ever said. He, first he said, he's like, are you crying? She wasn't just crying. I mean, she was like, it was like people three doors down could have heard. And he was totally messing with her. Like, it was the sweetest thing. 
And then he just, he, um, she kissed him and she told him that she loved him. And he said, good night. Oh. How weird is that? He said, good night. I, I've, just, I've always been haunted by that. And I looked it up. I actually discovered that that was a statement that the early church stated after that happened because I was so, I, I just was mystified by it. To me, it spoke of this man actually had a new peace, that this was not the end, only the beginning. It was a profound moment, profound moment I'll never forget. I'm so grateful um, that I was allowed to be a part of that holy, holy moment. Jesus has that kind of calm confidence, total control, total control. He is the trailblazer. He has pioneered the path by which we can confront the difficulties of existence, even death itself. It doesn't mean that death doesn't sting. It stings terribly. Um, it still feels unnatural. Um, loss is, a, is in the older we get, the more people we lose, and it's just a part of human existence. Sadly, we live in a culture that has so diminished the reality of death um, and it, that, that people aren't prepared for it. Uh, and I think that this is, the cross is one of the only things I think that can give us, um, that can allow us the space to grieve um, and at the same time not lose our hope. Uh, and this is why we have to consider this, that he was confident in his victory over death itself. In John chapter 10, verses 17 through 18, it says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. I want to just close um, with a section um, from my book. I'm going to do my best to not um, lose my stuff in front of you. Uh, but uh, um, uh, the final chapter of the book is really around my father's death last year. Um, and I had far less to say about this statement. I couldn't, I, the theological reflections weren't coming. And I realize now that it's because it was a statement that needed to be lived um, and experienced, not necessarily analyzed. Um, and so I, um, I, I just will say this about the death of Jesus, that what happens when the heart stops may be an impenetrable mystery, but how we face death is something we can and should talk about. Um, and for the Christian, our courage, our hope is derived from the core conviction that Jesus has conquered death. No one took the life of Jesus. He willingly surrendered it. This was his plan, and he saw it through to the end. He yielded up his spirit. He gave up his spirit. No one takes my life from me. And I think that this is why we, um, not one of the Gospels says that he died. Isn't that interesting? Not one of them says that he died. They want us to understand that his death was not the end, but the beginning of a new relationship. In fact, his death was as miraculous as his birth. Ever since Jesus uttered these words, death became, has become rede redefined for the child of God. We shall only fall asleep to awake to more life than we have tasted before. Sleep, in fact, has always been the Christian word for death, uh, which I think is so profound. So this is the final um, segment. At 6 p.m. on February 7th, I received the call from the hospital Dad was once again in the ER. I had the power of attorney, and permissions were needed for me to move forward without, with any procedures for my father. I had talked to this doctor many times before, but he was different this time, hesitant. Finally, he said slowly, Josh, your dad's internal organs are shutting down. He's very sick, and I think it would be cruel to intubate him. I feel it's time that we put him on comfort care. No matter how true that statement was, to give a doctor that I did not know permission to let my father die was an unbearable responsibility. It did not feel like it should be mine to give that permission. I wanted to say, how can I give you that? I'm not, I'm not God. But I knew if Alexander could not decide for himself, it had to be me. All right, doctor, how long do I have? He could go within a few hours, but knowing the resilience of your father, my guess is that he will survive at least through the night but I can't tell you with any certainty. I hung up shell-shocked and overwhelmed. 
Darcy embraced me. Her ability to enter the pain of others is unmatched by anyone I've ever met. Time seemed to slow in her arms, and then suddenly it rushed forward. 6.20 p.m., we had booked the flight to Anchorage from Seattle. It would leave at 10 p.m. I was on the road by 6.30 p.m., making the three-hour drive, three drive in a record two and a half hours. I caught the flight with a half hour to spare. Time slowed again until the plane landed at 3.30 a.m., caught a second flight from Anchorage to Kenai at 6 a.m. At 6.30 a.m., I walked by the familiar stuffed Kodiak bear frozen inside the timeless diorama on the way to the rental car. 6.40 a.m., I was out in the permanent twilight of the Alaskan morning, everything white and black. It was a blizzard outside. I drove as quickly as possible through the winter landscape toward the hospital where Dad, Alexander, lay dying. At 7 a.m., I walked into his room, and there he was, my stranger father. He had been bathed. His hair was combed back long, and his beard was the unruliest I'd ever seen it. It was the only gray hair on his 69-year-old body. The only evidence that he was in horrible shape were the sores on his legs that poked out from underneath the bed sheets, which I quickly covered. To be honest, it was the best he had looked in a decade. He seemed like a man prepared for a funeral. There was no bad smell, just the soft light and the sound of the various medical devices monitoring his demise. Here he was, closing his earthly pilgrimage among his people, Frank, the chaplain, the doctors, and the multitude of lovely nurses, young and old, that cared for him. They patiently endured the stench of him not bathing for a month at a time and the internal deterioration of his organs that seemed to seep through his skin. They endured his loss of coherence due to the lack of oxygen and his isolation and withdrawals that would cause him to lash out, panic, and maybe even cry. The women there even tolerated his relentless offers, regardless of how young or old, to take them out on dates when he could walk again, which of course he never did. After my dad passed, one of the young nurses came in and kissed his forehead. She said, I'm going to miss you, old timer. I guess I don't get that date you promised. I was embarrassed and moved. All of them seemed to truly value him. All I can say is that the church could learn a lot about how to care for people by observing that group. This was his church, and I will be forever grateful to them for the care they provided my father. I walked over to the side of the bed. I had written and recorded a song called Home the week before, so I pulled it up on my phone and set it next to his head as he slept. As the song began to play, I ran my hand across his warm forehead and took his hand worn with those cigarette-stained fingers into my own illustrated hand. I bowed my head and prayed, thank you, Lord, for letting me be here. I needed to be here. I was too physically tired to cry, but he was not. As my voice carried from the song, it brought him out of his morphine-induced slumber. He squeezed my hand tight, and tears rolled down his face. I moved my face closer to his and said, it's okay, Dad, I'm here. I love you, it's okay. He squeezed my hand to let me know he understood as the tears increased. He tried to open his mouth, but he couldn't talk. He tried to see me, but he couldn't open his eyes. But I was there, his son, and his grip tightened as if he were hanging between this side and the other side of his appointed time, like a man too scared to depart. The nurse came in. I asked Dad if he was hurting, and he squeezed my hand to let me know that he was. He received relief and moved back into his dying sleep while I watched his breathing become more and more shallow, as if his body was being compressed by death itself. Time continued to remind me of what was coming. At 3 p.m., the nurse told me my dad was close and left me alone. What an appropriate word. He was close to the close of his time. The lengthening spaces between each breath gave the impression that he was dying with every refusal of the body to release the last breath that it took in. I put on my song again, and his eyelids lifted as soon as my voice, which felt like it belonged to someone else, sang the words, some days I just fall apart. So many worries haunt this heart. Some days I don't know where to start. Some days I can lose you in the dark. I stood over him with my face no more than a foot from his and stared straight into his fading, fearful eyes. He began to weep again. His distress from his inability to breathe was unbearable to watch, and I wanted to look away. I couldn't help him, and yet I was. I touched his cheek and told him it was okay, that it was time, 
It may seem like a strange thing to say to someone who is about to close out their journey through time as we know it, but life is a gift and it does not surrender itself easily. The look changed on his face and he began to become calm as I sung the words of the bridge. Remind me that it's all right to cry. Remind me if I hurt, I'm alive. Remind me that you're by my side. Remind me that the light makes darkness hide. The words of the final chorus, released into the ether. Home, will you guide me home? Tell me I'm not alone. And in 10 holy seconds before the closing lines, he surrendered his last breath and he was gone. His tears had ceased and mine continued as I listened in a disassociated state to my own voice, which seemed as far away as my father. Some days I can tear through your world rip apart our love without a word. Some days I'm surprised when I wake up to open up my eyes to your touch. The details of what followed are not necessary, but that experience in that room with my father was holy and brought to me the clarity needed to finish this book, a book I have toiled over for two years but could not complete. For me, the seventh word from the cross could not be analyzed. It had to be experienced. What I discovered in that moment with my dad is that the presence of the living Christ who can feel as elusive to me as anyone else made himself known in a way I have rarely experienced before. Why? Because as I've been saying, his peace, which is himself, is rarely found in the absence of suffering. It's found in the middle of it. This is why we stumble toward eternity because the upside down kingdom of Jesus who is our peace is most fully experienced in what we try so desperately to avoid suffering. Remember no cross, no Christ. When I was willing to enter my dad's suffering, look into his dying eyes and not look away, I found my peace. Jesus was with me and it's my deepest conviction that what my dad experienced as he looked into my eyes, man of mixture that I am, was Jesus himself. This is a great mystery, but I believe that Christ's words from the cross became Alexander's experience, words that transformed his valley of Acor into a door of hope, forgiveness, acceptance, comfort, belonging, intimacy, satisfaction, victory, final rest. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your gospel and for its ability to bring transformation to our lives. My prayer right now is that you would be the comforter that comforts our hearts and our minds. Lord, we all know people like my dad. Maybe some here are experiencing their own um, closing of their story on this side of eternity. I don't know this individual stories. I don't know the the, the weights of existence that people bring in with them. But I do know this, you care. And your confidence at the close of your earthly pilgrimage should give us a confidence that everything that needs to be done has already been done in you. And so we turn to you, Jesus, and we thank you for your love. And we ask that you would fill us again and again with an overwhelming sense of your love by your spirit, that we might be conduits of grace to those around us that are hurting, that feel lost, that feel invisible, that we would be able to be conduits of your grace that allows people to know that they are seen, that they are loved, that they matter. And Lord, I pray that you would draw many to yourself. May we be the witnesses you have called us to be, and may we keep the cross at the center of everything we do. We pray this in your name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.